In this screencast, we will discuss the use of a systematic search. At the end of the screencast, you should be able to describe the importance of a systematic search for chest radiographs and CTs, and outline a framework for developing a differential diagnosis in the chest. A systematic search is important to employ for every radiograph you read. By being systematic and looking at each element of the radiograph, you're much less likely to miss an important finding. This is key when you are looking at what appears to be a normal radiograph, like we see on the left, or in an obviously abnormal radiograph, like we have on the right. In both cases, looking at each element of the chest in the same order for every patient has been shown to reduce the likelihood that you miss an important finding. Many different approaches have been described. I like the inside out approach. I start by looking at the mediastinum, the hyla, then the lungs, the pleural surface, the chest wall, and then the upper abdomen. By doing this in the same way every time, I am more consistent in the abnormalities that I find. And I also employ a very similar inside-out approach when I'm looking at a chest CT. A key to localizing abnormalities in the chest is recognizing and remembering your soft tissue interfaces. The features or the lines that we see on a radiograph are due to differences in density between adjacent structures. So muscle and bone, or muscle and the lung tissue, or the heart and the lung, or blood vessels and the lung. And each of these different interfaces, when obscured or abnormal, as Dr. Ayub has described in the past, help us identify where something is located in the chest. And to quickly review those interfaces, we have the azygosophageal recess, the paraspinal lines, the descending aorta, the heart borders, the right paratracheal line, the pleural surfaces, and the hemidiaphragms. On the lateral radiograph, we can see the posterior wall of the trachea, we can see the right and left bronchi, the right and left pulmonary arteries, the heart border, the pleural surface, and the hemidiaphragms. And continually looking at each of these lines on every radiograph will help you identify subtle abnormalities and then help you localize where those abnormalities are. It's also important to remember there are a few blind spots in the chest. In the lung apices, you have overlapping ribs and clavicle, and sometimes nodules or masses can get obscured in this location. Remember that behind the heart and behind the diaphragms, we still have lung superimposed. And so always look carefully in these locations to make sure you're not missing a subtle abnormality that's obscured by the diaphragms or the heart. When thinking about developing your differential diagnosis, it's important to have a simple framework that you use for each patient. And I'll give you the framework that was taught to me by one of my mentors, the D-ALPO approach. D stands for demographics, or brief clinical history, A for acuity, L for location, P for pattern, and O for other. And we'll go through each of those elements here. Demographics, which can also be thought of as a brief clinical history, are critical to creating a good differential diagnosis when looking at chest abnormalities. In the chest, many different abnormalities are nonspecific and without clinical information it's going to be hard to provide something more than just calling it an airspace opacity. But if you have the patient's age, 
their sex, whether they've had surgery, whether they currently have cancer or had cancer in the past, and whether they're immunocompromised, you can often narrow your differential diagnosis with this with these five elements of the clinical history. In addition to these demographics or brief clinical acuity is often critical. Processes that look very similar will have different presentations, some being acute and others being chronic. Common acute abnormalities that we see every day on chest radiographs are going to be atelectasis, aspiration, pulmonary edema, or infection. But on just a plain radiograph without any information or on a chest CT, it can be difficult to distinguish these different entities from other chronic processes. When we know someone's presenting with chronic shortness of breath or chronic cough, we have a different list of diseases that we're going to focus on. And I've listed some of the common ones here. So emphysema, cancer, interstitial lung disease, or changes related to surgery. We move to the next element of the D-ALPO approach, location. This is where we start to get into the interpretation of the radiographs themselves. So identifying an opacity on a radiograph, the, one of the first steps is localizing where it is. We talked a little bit about the chest wall, the mediastinum, but even within the lung itself, it's very important to decide where is this process within the lung that down into three different basic categories. Diffuse, which means it involves the upper lobes and lower lobes and typically both lungs. Central abnormalities, which are involving the alveoli and the lung tissue around the main pulmonary arteries and veins or around the trachea and bronchi versus peripheral abnormalities that are really involving those distal airways or the alveoli up near the pleural surfaces. And then abnormalities that predominantly involve the upper lobes versus the lower lobes. The next element to radiograph interpretation is starting to recognize patterns of abnormality or patterns of opacity in the lungs. And this is a very difficult skill but if you try to break it down into some simple components using consistent language, hopefully you can start to develop some comfort with that. And we'll have a whole screencast dedicated to patterns that will go into much more detail. But just to introduce you to some of the basic concepts, when I think about patterns, I first think about, is this process affecting the air spaces, meaning it's filling or collapsing the alveoli? or is it affecting the interstitial spaces of the lung tissue? Once I've decided whether it's an airspace or interstitial process, I'll try to use some basic terms to describe it. And on chest CT, the terms we, you will often hear are going to be ground glass, which is sort of an intermediate density or partial filling or partial collapse of the air spaces. Consolidation, which is a dense process that's completely filling the air spaces. Nodular processes, which are often little growths or little masses that are well-defined. Cystic changes, where the lung tissue has been destroyed or has been expanded so that there is less interstitium and less cellularity to the lung. Or septal thickening, where the interlobular septa, which comprise the interstitial tissue of the lung, starts to thicken or become filled with fluid or inflammation. The last component of the D-ALPO approach is looking at all the other things that could be going on in the radiograph outside of the lung. And these different components or non-pulmonary processes can help you build a picture that narrows your differential diagnosis or build a story that contributes to your confidence about the process that's going on. And these are some of those basic things that I want you to start thinking about. Is there a pleural effusion? Is there a pneumothorax? 
Does the airway look collapsed or nodular or filled with mucus? In the mediastinum, do you see a mass? Do you see cardia, cardiac enlargement or lymph node enlargement? Is there evidence of surgical change that might indicate the patient had a recent surgery or had a tumor removed? Do they have lines and tubes that may indicate their respiratory status or whether they're getting chemotherapy? And are their bones normal or abnormal, such as seeing a metastasis in the bones that might indicate the person has cancer? If you develop a systematic search pattern looking at each study from the inside out and then interpret the chest x-ray findings using simple terminology like ground glass, consolidation, upper lobe or lower lobe predominance. You can then narrow your differential diagnosis based on the relevant clinical information and hopefully start to make sense of the chest x-rays and chest CTs that you have on your patients.